This month's topic is college entrance exams. What are all of the options and how to prepare? I've divided the topic into two parts. In this month's show, I'll cover qualifying exams, the PSAT, the SAT, and the ACT. Next month, I'll cover exams for college credit, the SAT twos, AP, IB, college specific exams, as well as the no test option. As many of you know, there are three major college qualifying exams. Again, the PSAT, the SAT, and the ACT. Based on questions I typically get from parents, what most of you might not know is which of these your students should take, when they should take these tests, and how they should prepare for such important exams while maintaining their classroom grades. Let me begin with the PSAT. The PSAT, or Preliminary SAT is most often viewed as the test that students take in order to prepare for the SAT or Scholastic Aptitude Test. However, nothing could be further from the truth. The PSAT is an extremely important exam in its own right. Its full name is the PSAT NMSQT, or National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. Once upon a time, the NMSQT was its own independent exam but in 1971, the National Merit Scholarship Corporation adopted the PSAT as its principal criterion to qualify for the prestigious award of National Merit Scholar, semifinalist, or finalist. The organization then requires students to complete a more holistic application, which will help them get a better idea of the whole student and inform them as they make their decisions and select National Merit Scholarship semifinalists and finalists. Were you aware that students who earn these designations are usually offered full ride scholarships to most of the top universities in the country? Now, in order to qualify, you must reach a certain level on the PSAT test. If you can reach 97th percentile or higher, typically in the state of New Hampshire, that will get you commendation from the National Merit Scholarship Corporation and enter you into the process of applying for National Merit Scholar. Uh, however, the National Merit Scholarship Corporation will tell you that it's not exactly a percentile, it's a, it's a test index score. It's proprietary information, so nobody really knows other than the National Merit Scholarship Corporation what exactly they mean when they say a test index. And I think what, the reason they don't want to necessarily share all of the particulars is they don't want anybody trying to game the system, so to speak. But typically, students who have hit 97th percentile in New Hampshire will end up qualifying uh, for the first round of application. Now, that index score takes into consideration the math, critical reading, and writing sections all combined. So the interesting thing to remember is you do not have to hit 97th percentile in all three areas. You see, some students will do really well with the math, but in the critical reading, not so much, and vice versa. So if you can hit uh, into the 90th percentile in all three, you have a very good likelihood that you will reach 97th percentile overall, or that you might meet their minimums for their index score. But just imagine falling just short of the index score say you hit 96th percentile on the PSAT. Can you imagine the frustration of the student who realizes that with just a little bit of training and preparation, most certainly they would have qualified for National Merit Scholarship, thereby qualifying for a free ride for college. Imagine the frustration of the parents who realize, had they known, they would have gotten the training for their kids and with just a little bit of practice, certainly they could have boosted their score just a little bit more. Fortunately for my family, two of my sons scored high enough on the PSAT to receive acknowledgement from the National Merit Scholarship Corporation and thereby were offered free ride scholarships to many prominent universities in the country. One of the universities, the University of Oklahoma, who, which prides itself on having more National Merit Scholars uh, finalists at its university than any other university in the country, offered one of my sons a full ride plus $5,000 in travel and technology stipend. 
Naturally, my sons chose instead to attend a private New England college, which does not offer full ride scholarships, no matter what your test scores. Uh, fortunately, however, they offered so much uh, scholarship money that we were able to afford the small tuition that was left over. But that's the thing about the PSAT. Even the best high schools don't put enough emphasis on it. Students do not have to score in a 97th percentile in reading, verbal, and writing. If they can get close in all three, your child could be going to college for free. Now, the PSAT is offered to students in their sophomore and junior years, but you should know that during the sophomore year, whatever their scores are, it becomes a moot point. It's the junior year or third year of high school or second to last year of high school, however you want to look at it, that the score really matters. Next month, that is in April, the National Merit Scholarship Corporation will be contacting high schools attempting to verify contact information about students who reached the minimum score index to be considered for National Merit Scholarship. Contacts from NMSC will be made to the students via the high school regarding the next step in the application process in the fall of their senior years. But if you have a student who reached 97th percentile or higher, you want to make sure that you contact school officials next month to find out if your child was included in National Merit Scholarship consideration. So now I hope you have a better idea of just how important the PSAT and MSQT really is. The PSAT and SAT are different tests. Yes, they are formatted similarly and created by the same test makers, but the PSAT is half the length of the SAT. And even though most counselors, teachers, parents, students, and even yours truly will quite often put a zero on the end of a PSAT score to compare it to what that score might be for the SAT, once again, they are different tests. Now, both tests can be improved upon with training. In fact, I have yet to have a student who has done all of his or her homework attended all the classes and, and put forth his or her best effort who has not improved the SAT score by a minimum of 100 points. In fact, most of my students see improvements of over 200 points. Most of the students see these improvements incrementally. However, we do have a good percentage of students who will make a huge jump all at once. But every student is unique and individual, so in preparing for and training for these tests, Keep in mind, individualized training is the best. So the next question is, when and how should we start preparing our students for these tests? Well, let me give you the straight A method. In winter or spring of the sophomore year, students should start preparing to take the full-blown SAT. And they should take either March, May, or June, they should take the SAT test. Then they should continue training over the summer, off and on, at their own pace, but they should stay connected to building vocabulary and such. And then in the fall of their junior years, they should refresh their training, take the SAT test again, first Saturday in October. Occasionally it's the second Saturday, but usually the first Saturday in October, and then take the PSAT the Saturday after that. In some schools, they will offer it on a Wednesday after the SAT, but at any rate, we prepare them for the full-blown SAT so that when they take the PSAT, it's going to seem like my son said when he came out of the PSAT and scored in the 99th percentile, he said, wow, that seemed like a piece of cake compared to the SAT that he had just taken the previous week. So preparing the, according to the straight A method will get the students ready for the SAT first, followed by the PSAT, but then we want to get the highest SAT score as well. So the final SAT should be taken perhaps spring of their junior year. Again, we recommend that students take these tests at least two times, sometimes three or more would make sense as well, depending on the individual case. But you always have fall of the senior year to fall back on, if you will, in case the students want to give one last shot at improving their scores. To focus on the SAT itself for a moment, remember 
two or three times is really a minimum because students can continue to improve with ongoing training. The test is offered October, November, December, January, March, May, and June. Notice it's not offered in February or April. But prepare to take it multiple times because the College Board and most colleges accept what is known as the super score or your very best math, critical reading, and writing from any of the tests into one best score. Currently, an 1800 or 600 per section would be considered uh, kind of a benchmark of excellence. With a 600 per, uh, per section, most students will be able to get accepted into most universities. Now, if you want to enter an Ivy League school, then we'd like to see a 700 per section or a 2100 or better. But let me remind you about what I shared with you last month. Many colleges pride themselves on rejecting students with a perfect 2400. So these tests are very important, but they are not the only part of the picture. They're an important part of the picture, but you better develop the rest of your profile as well. Finally, I need to point out that the PSAT will be formatted completely differently this October of 2015. Uh, they're doing this ahead of the complete overhaul of the SAT, which will see its changes introduced in spring of 2016. Now, College Board still has not indicated if spring of 2016 means the March test or the May test, so we're keeping our eyes on that development as well. College Board made these announcements a little more than a year ago, and they've been releasing examples of what the tests will look like. I'll probably spend an entire month on the topic in the future uh, to discuss what these changes look like. But we will continue preparing our students for the regular SAT all the way through January, potentially March of next year, and then we'll have to make the switch at that point. But the PSAT changes will come this fall, and we're going to start training our students for the new format uh, the summer of 2015 and, of course, the September, fall of 2015 as well. The ACT recently surpassed the SAT as the college entrance exam taken by more students across the country. Now, the SAT is still more popular in the Northeast, down the East Coast, and on the West Coast. But the ACT is much more popular in the Midwest as well as in the South. And again, both tests, SAT and ACT, are accepted by most colleges. And you can look at the two tests as, say, a Cadillac and a Lexus. Both are excellent vehicles, uh, but they have their own style. Same thing with the SAT and the ACT. Both are excellent college admissions exams accepted by pretty much all the universities. It's just that one is formatted a little differently than the other. There are a lot of similarities between these two tests and how we prepare students for them. But the ACT has an English section, which would be similar to the SAT writing, a reading section, which of course is similar to the critical reading, a math section, and a science section. To be honest, the science section is really more uh, reading comprehension within a scientific context. They present tables, charts, scientific data, much of which the students would not know from their science classes. And they present it, uh, making students read through the materials, but like any good reading section, the answers can be found or extrapolated from reading the material that they offer. The math section of the ACT includes a half a dozen or so concepts that are not included on the SAT, but much of the way the material is presented is quite similar. When a student prepares for the SAT or the ACT, they're really preparing for both. It's, it's taking a standardized exam that is uh, challenging for many students because its material is presented a little bit differently than it is presented in your typical classroom. So there is a lot of crossover, but we recommend that students prepare for one of the tests at a time so that they do not get tripped up with the change in formatting. We do recommend that students take both SAT and ACT. With just a little bit more training, a student can switch from taking the SAT 
and take the ACT. Again, there will be a few concepts that need to be covered and the students will need to get used to that format. The benchmark score for excellence for the ACT is a 27 or higher. Uh, the ACT also, by the way, allows for super score. Uh, that was a more recent development. But the, the 27 or higher would be sort of like the 1800 or higher on the SAT. Once again, if you want to talk about making it into the Ivy League, uh, you probably want to hit a 31 or better on the ACT. One of the advantages to taking the ACT is that many colleges require either the SAT test with one, two, or three SAT2 subject tests or the ACT test alone. I know that the, S the ACT has a science section, but as we discussed earlier, the science section really is nothing more than reading comprehension. My only guess is that universities say that if a student can read scientific material, and do well on the critical reading of that scientific material, then they expect that they will do well in the science exams or in the science courses at those universities. The ACT test is offered in September, October, December, February, April, and June. So not November, not January, not in March or May. But we recommend that students plan on taking both tests so that they can maximize their position in their college applications and get the best result in terms of scholarship money and admissions. We'll see you next month when we will pick up the conversation with those subject tests.